friends. Sadie, I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Sean's gonna go and start. My name is Stephen Bluestein. And I'm Sean Connect. And, and we're, we're the, the founders, founders of Pride Bites Pet, Pet Products. We are seeking $200,000 for 10% of our company. If you're anything like us, your pet is a member of your family. And because of that, we believe that they should be spoiled in a way that is completely unique. So let me introduce you to Pride Bites. We allow you to design, customize, and buy anything you want for your furry friend. Welcome to the Shark Tank Podcast. Each week, one of the best entrepreneurs from ABC's network smash hit Shark Tank teaches you how to swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. And now your host, serial entrepreneur, TJ Hale. Welcome, everybody, to the Shark Tank Podcast. I'm here with Stephen, the co-founder of Pride Bites. Very excited to have you on the show. Stephen, I apologize in advance. I don't have any pets, so I really don't want to screw this up because I know how particular pet lovers are. I'm going to let you kind of take the lead on this one, all right? No, not a problem at all. All right, well, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Well, I'm really excited. So for those of you who forgot, I'll play a clip before the show starts, but Stephen was just on Shark Tank. He shook hands with Lori and Robert for his company, Pride Bites, which makes high-quality, custom pet toys for those uh, furry members of your family. So um, what's the latest, man? How did it go after Shark Tank? Uh, yeah, Shark Tank has been uh, an amazing experience. Uh, very, very surreal. Um, you know, we scaled about probably 20 times our size, uh, through the weekend. And, uh, it's amazing to open up, uh, you know, your CRM platforms and see percentage points at 80,000 percent points. So, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome to see that. So, Whoa, almost broke my stuff here. Um, so <laughs> do you have to chain people that are desks for the weekend after shark tank? Like how do you get people to stick around all weekend long to make sure that everything gets covered? What's, what was the plan there? A lot of teams, a lot of moving parts. Um, our our team is uh, works incredibly hard and um, just very passionate people. So I think you know just just the fact that you're on Shark Tank gets everybody motivated and um, everyone to buy in. So not not much uh, discipline there or, or leadership needs to take place in terms of getting the whole team together. Uh, pretty much just comes together naturally. Great. Now for those of you watching for the first time or if you forgot, there is a premium content episode that Stephen joined me for. The link is right here at the bottom of the screen. You can jump on that if you're curious about how exactly they got on Shark Tank and what advice they have for other people who are trying to get on. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. I want to go back to the beginning, Stephen, and talk about how the dream began, how the business started, and uh, kind of the trajectory of the company early on. Take us through that. Yeah, absolutely. So we started in our college apartment. Uh, it was three other of my best friends and myself, um, Sam Lamp. Shonk Neck and Ting Lu. Uh, we came together just to make a better dog toy. We all had dogs and we wanted to do something better, create a better product. Um, after about a year and a half of prototyping, about 40 different prototypes in the making, uh, we came up with the Pride Bite, which was um, our take on a better dog toy. About two months after we launched uh, the Pride Bite into market, we were voted best dog toy of the year by Pet Business Magazine, which is cool. our foremost trade magazine. Uh, thank you. It was, it was pretty awesome. We expanded to about 2,500 stores in our first year. Um, really coming out of college, uh, just hitting the pavement, going door to door, selling however we could. Uh, about a year and a half into the process, what we started to see is pe people really started to reach out wanting to customize our dog toys. And it gave us this kind of aha moment in the pet space where we didn't see any customization taking place at all. And really all you saw was these promotional product companies who were just slapping images on product. Uh, and what we decided to do was leverage um, our techno technology, our proprietary manufacturing systems, uh, and come out with a full line of customizable pet products. So that's what you see today. Excellent. And now, you know, I'm thinking when you talk about starting the company and filling this niche, I go back to the social network and how, you know, Facebook and most companies are started to impress women. Were you really in it for the love of dogs or was it to impress the ladies? Because dogs and food are the key to the ladies' hearts. Like what's really going on here? What was your motivation? <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, all of us, in terms of getting a dog at first, that's the first aha uh, moment that goes in your head as well. Besides the company, uh, when you're a college student and you're on campus with all these beautiful women. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it definitely uh, came to mind often. And I think at the very beginning, we were, uh, you know, we would post up with our dogs and be selling things. And often our friends would come up, grab our dogs and want to go walk around campus with the dogs themselves. So 
I'm not sure whose dogs were uh, a better opportunity, whether it was for our friends or for the people in the company. Go get her, Max. Go get her. Yeah, So, definitely. Well, that's a big honor to be uh, recognized as top toy. Now, um, the thing is the pet market is so competitive, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what early obstacles did you see in terms of either people telling you it was stupid to try or in terms of getting muscled out by their competitors, trying to get shelf space? What are the things that stick out as some of the early hurdles you had to clear to make this work? Just that. I mean, the the proving aspect to the entire industry is something that you have to go through. You know, you're at the bottom of the totem pole and um, you need to really work your way into the system uh, and prove over and over some examples to thousands of people. And, you know, if you take our product, the Pride Bite, as a dog toy, we make the best high quality product for $9.99 you're ever going to find on the market. But, you know, you have big dogs, you have small dogs, you have teething dogs. And so if one of them gets a hold of it and happens to rip it up, all of a sudden it's seen as this terrible product. However, you know, really, if you take, like I said, the other segments of the market, um, you know, we're we're about as good or as premium a product as you're going to find. So I think it's really continuing to push to um, get into the stores, get in front of people, continue to tell your story. And, you know, over time, uh, it just resonates with folks and, you know, you become uh, a household name. All right. I do want to come back to this. I think one of the things that's most interesting to listeners is what you guys did in terms of successful marketing, how you built your tribe, how you broke into retail. Hi there, fridge lady. And, uh, <laughs> but I want to talk about Shark Tank and kind of your plan behind making this all work. So in terms of the show, if they want to hear exactly how you got on, they can go to the premium content, but I want to also go through some of the feedback that you got in the experience. Tell us, I know that you had tried to get on Shark Tank at least once previous, previously. Uh, what was your mindset this time going around? Like if it didn't work this time, were you going to quit or were you just going to keep hitting it until you got in? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we don't really have uh, – our, our mentality definitely is never quit. So I think we would have definitely kept trying. Uh, but, yeah, we – you know, like I said before, you know, our expectations, we, we didn't really create that big of expectation. Um, we really just wanted to continue to push forward and um, take every checkpoint as for what it was um, and, and really just keep that momentum going. And then uh, when you got on, let's, let's actually go to the show. I got some clips here. You would ask okay. for um, 200000 for 10%, you and Sean. Mm-hmm. And sure. It's interesting because you mentioned that your segment was only about 45 minutes long, which is a little on the short side for a successful negotiation. Usually they last a little bit longer. Sure. But I sure. thought you guys were pretty kind of bing, bang, boom in the tank. And what I thought was interesting is Mark Cuban went out first. So did you think that Mark – Mark doesn't usually invest in dog products. Did you know he was going to go out? Was that a shock to you? No, you know, in the actual negotiation, it was much more favorable. Um, I didn't think he was somebody that we should key on to. I thought that he was, uh, you know – far from the shark that would come in on our deal, as you're just saying. He doesn't typically go after pet companies, but, you know, for an e-commerce company, I thought there was an opportunity there. Um, you know, when he went out, I actually had a rebuttal with him. Um, he doesn't typically go after um, Very respectful. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he was saying was that, um, you know, there was too much liability within one factory of ours or in our manufacturing setup, which actually we've mitigated that completely. So he actually didn't allow me to continue to discuss what um, our proprietary system was all about. And that's actually why Robert came into the deal quite um, quickly afterwards. Understood. Well, let's stay on that because the proprietary system was interesting. When you said that, it was kind of like that, well, we've got a special sauce that makes us Mm -hmm. better. And then you go to the next topic. What is that? Because what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we've uh, created a SaaS platform that operates our entire company, um, all the project management aspects, specifically customization um, with all of our factories overseas. Um, so at any given point, basically, I can pull out my phone and identify where a product is in the process, um, whether it's in a specific factory, what locations it's at, um, how far it's going to take to get completed. Um, so it's really the fact that um, you know most companies, you have to be much larger in scale to be able to pull off what we do. Um, and using the SaaS platform that we've developed that allows us to do this quickly, efficiently, and transparently. And he didn't, he didn't bite on that? He wasn't interested in going forward? Um, I think, you know, he, he didn't really hear that whole pitch. He, he kind of got out of it as um, at the very beginning when I was just saying, like, how we were able to go through the process. And I didn't really talk about um, how we have multiple manufacturers and multiple factories working with us. Um, and so I think that was his... Um, the hang up at the very beginning was it was kind of out of his expertise level 
then there could be too much liability. But yet, you know, I reveal that there wasn't um, later on in the show. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, I wanted to ask before we go into these other, and I think that was interesting criticism you gave in terms of the factory that you mitigated. That's one of the things I mm-hmm. like about Shark Tank is, hey, here's something that bothers me. Fix that. And But I'm still out. Uh, what was your optimal, what did your optimal outcome look like when you were going in? I know how much money you're asking for. I know what equity mm-hmm. you're willing to give up. But what was it you were really after? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're, you, you, when you walk in there, you're just stunned by the fact that you're in there. Um, you know, I don't know if, you, if you're a fan of the show and you've seen a lot of them like I have. You know, I've, I've envisioned myself walking down that row of, of the fish tank row for, for years now and then sitting on that X. And, um, you know, my friends always tease me that my mom used to feed me 10K reports instead of children's books. So you can imagine, you know, being, being in front of them at that moment is probably the best thing in my life. Um, I was just smiling from ear to ear. You know, I think it was just... Like, I couldn't believe these guys, and I've worked so hard to be here and to finally get that opportunity. Um, you know, it's just amazing. I don't, I don't think really anything is kind of passing through. We, we broke it down into four options, which was, you know, you weren't going to get a deal and you were going to look bad. You weren't going to get a deal and you were going to look good. You were going to get a deal and you were going to look bad. And you were going to get a deal and you were going to look good. And if you could break out those four different scenarios and say, hey, if either one of those happened to me, what is my chances to get on air and actually go on Shark Tank? Uh, I would say that the best chance was to get a deal and look good. So in our case, we knew the different situations. Um, I talked to my business partners before I walked in. Um, I knew kind of what uh, realm of equity we were working with, and I knew what the sharks were capable of. So it wasn't so much about the value. You know, we were raising at a much higher valuation before I even walked in there. Um, but it was really the value of the sharks and what they brought to the table at that specific time, which, which I was most focused on. Um, so I think that's why it gave us the ability to only be in there 45 minutes, which you said is on the shorter side of things, especially after talking with everybody. Um, but also gave us the ability to strike quick uh, through the negotiation process and really not lapse in terms of what other groups go through, maybe talking with each other or seeing if things were working out. Um, we had a clear defined strategy um, and, and we got that strategy done. Interesting. So in terms of that efficiency, tell me about your partnership. I saw Sean on TV. He and I spoke before you aired, but it sounds like you have a couple other buddies from Kansas that are uh, part of your Marvel Avengers team or whatever you guys call sure. yourselves. So tell me, take me through sure, it. Sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, Sean is uh, my, one of my best friends in life since I was sixth grade. Um, I actually just got back from his bachelor party this past weekend. He's getting married over the summer, which is really exciting. Rock on. Um, but in general, um, yeah, thank you. Um, we're all best friends. Sam Lampy is another one of ours, uh, our guys, um, who's from the Kansas team. I've grown up with him in Houston since I was very little. Um, Team Lou is our Chinese brother from another mother. Uh, we found him at the University of Kansas. Um, you know, you're typically used to seeing foreign exchange students be quiet um, and not really um, out there in terms of outspokenness. Um, King was uh, very dynamic from the second that I met him in a gym at the University of Kansas. He was shaking everybody's hands in the gym. Um, and you could just tell that there was something more to Ting than, than what was, uh, you know, on the, on the, fa- on the front facing side. Uh, and, you know, that later do we discover that Ting has um, the ability to do some amazing things in China and to work with um, the Chinese culture and build systems that are just incredible. And we're really thankful to have them. So, you know, we're all really close friends. Um, my mom, you know, we used to all sleep together or sleep over each other's houses when we were younger. And my mom used to say, you know, money doesn't sleep, you know, get up and get out and get a job. So it's only fitting that today that we all work together and um, have added on some other of our, our great friends um, along the way and just have a real family here. Awesome. All right. So Kevin's interesting. I want to talk because he kind of came in later to egg the deal on, but, uh, how, were you disappointed that Kevin didn't want your dog slices? Cause you got, you got, you got beer toys, you've got blankets. Like why is he hating on the sure. dog slices? Yeah. You know, I don't know. Maybe he was on the Atkins diet or something, you know, maybe the carb overload or something, you know, and, and what was like in the tank, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, you know, I, I actually, you, you think about him as being the, the fearful one. When you get to him uh, and all the questions he's going to ask, you know that something's going to come up, maybe a licensing deal or royalty deal or something, and um, that he's going to be hard on you. And, uh, in fact, I didn't think he was difficult at all. I thought it was really nice. And, you know, we had a quick back and forth that they didn't really show on TV. And then, obviously, he was the one kind of instigating everything towards the end. Um, so, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I thought Kevin was a, a great guy or Mr. Wonderful was a great guy. And, uh, you know, I would love to have uh, partnered up with him down the road. It would have been really uh, With Kevin, 
a lot of people go on the show and they kind of have Kevin in their blind spot. And then they come home and they watch it on TV and they realize after all things being considered that maybe they should have considered Kevin as a partner because they really enjoyed his comments. And, or, you know, they have kind of this moment where they think, man, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe Kevin should have been in the, uh, in the playbook. What, what were your thoughts on Kevin? Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was really nice. Uh, I, I, as, as well, I didn't really have a problem with him. Uh, you know, I think the royalty deals afterwards, when you're thinking about it, are actually really good deals. So, um, if one came across me, I probably would have accepted it. Um, you know, at the end, we we really, really thought uh, we had an opportunity to get all three of them. Uh, you know, I didn't hear him actually go out um, in the in the process. I never heard him say I'm out or that he was leaving behind or anything. Um, so, you know, it was kind of news to me to see that, uh, on, during the actual airing. Um, but yeah, we, we wanted him for sure. And, you know, when we had that moment where he stopped, I thought they were all going to go in together. It was, uh, we were really excited. You know, you made a good point. I didn't realize that I have out written in bold on all of them when they go out. I don't have that for Kevin. He never did go out or they didn't show Absolutely. It. So yeah, okay. Kevin withdrawals. That's what I'm going to call it. Did you have Kevin withdrawals after you left? Y- yeah, I guess, I guess I did have Kevin withdrawals. Maybe I should uh, go seek him out so I can. Fulfill those withdrawals. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna write about that. That's funny. All right, so uh, another clip I definitely want to play is Damon's, and I think this is as much for you know your discussion as it is for people listening. This is something I'm seeing a lot sure. more in Shark Tank, and certainly from clients I work with in real life, is the power of the direct to consumer social media model. Uh, here's Damon's clip. We know you're a pet guy. Lo- yeah, we, I love, we know. I love dogs. My offer is two hundred thousand for twenty percent. Well, thank you very much you. Uh, for that offer. We really appreciate Guys, it. Guys, so this is very this is very impressive. I like your logistics. My biggest challenge is the, your, you're not there online. And the area that I don't want to go into is the premium market of selling Chachki stuff to big stores and big outlets. So at this point, I don't think it's for me. I'm out. Thank you very much for thank your time. Thank you for your time. So... Damon doesn't want to do what he's best at, which is selling items into big retail. Did that surprise you at all, Stephen? No, it didn't. You know, the context I think that you didn't see before is we were talking a lot about manufacturing and um, kind of who he goes through sourcing overseas. And, um, you know, the lead up gave me reason to why he was going to back out. Now, um, you know, I don't think we had a specific target. Uh, We knew a lot about the sharks going in there. If I could have had one just on the side note, it would have been I wanted Damon really badly. I thought he was yeah. a perfect fit for our company, um, his, his branding and mixed with us. And, you know, I don't think he really gave us the chance. We started as a dog toy. We identified something within the pet space, um, you know, based on the great product that we created and then found the opening within customization. So there was only so much time to be able to prove out really what online was about. And I think within the two cents that we did it and the assumptions that we took from that, those two launchings, um, there was more than enough there to say, hey, this is something that we should take advantage of online and within the pet space. Um, and so, yeah, I think Damon going out was a bit of a shock um, to us. And, um, you know, we believe we've been great partners together. Yeah. And at the time, I suppose his Beyond the Tank hadn't aired, but he recently did one with a dog company where he was either in uh, PetSmart or what's the other one? Sorry, not a dog guy. Shoot. And Petco. Petco, no thank no you. Worries. He just was in their uh, headquarters. And I thought, you know what? It seems like there would have been an opportunity for collaboration there. So I'm kind of surprised he didn't. Uh, bite on it yeah and i think you know who who we expected that obviously we expected robert to come in the deal with him being such a big pet guy um, i don't think we ever expected in our wild dreams for Lori to come in uh which was a great pleasant surprise obviously and um to have to have um Damon involved in the deal would have been a great thing. Yeah, yeah. So that definitely caught my attention. But also the thing that surprised me is that Damon's very big on building the social direct-to-consumer platform. And I was looking at your Instagram page. And you guys have 84,000 followers. You've done a really good job on social media. Was there discussion about that in the tank? Because I think in terms of what the Sharks have done, that's the one tick box that's kind of missing. Like it, They're always interested in entrepreneurs that have built that social media sales model. Yeah, we, there was quite a bit of talk around it uh, in the tank. You know, we, we've grown that social media following basically within a two-year period of time. Wow. Um, and it's just showing that, um, you know, the type of consumer we have and um, how supportive our consumers are. And, it, you know, it, to us, it's a really grown local, um, spread local type theory for us. And we, we talked about it quite a bit. We talked about um, also what our capabilities were with him and doing some custom one-offs within stores and doing some in and outs within his big retailers. And um, there was something else holding him back. I wish I knew what that something else was. 
um, hope, hopefully one day I get to see Damon and meet him and, uh, you know, get the answer to what, what really was keeping him back from entering our deal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, guys, all right, I have something to tell you. I got to get this off my chest. That's right. Uh, <laughs> little, little session with the psychologist. Okay. So, um, Lori came in and undercut Robert's offer of 200,000 for 20%. She kind of did the prices right. $1 thing. She's like, I'll do it for 18%, which I like. Cause I'm curious sure. how low they'll bid it down. Although that doesn't always help you get the deal closed afterwards. Um, Sure. I thought your I'm a total boss moment was when you were negotiating with Robert over the percentage of equity. And I don't know if you were doing it intentionally or if you just didn't hear him, but uh, it was like the perfect mixture of passive aggressive and innocence in terms of negotiation. So I'm going to go ahead and play it so everyone can see it. What if we did 300000 for 20% and you guys came in together? Such a deal. You can't turn that down. 300000 for how much? Uh, 300000 for 20%. So 300,000 for 20%, you're saying $1.5 million value. With you came shots, in yeah. at a $2 shots. million dollar value. 300,000 for 30%. Oh, 20%, sorry. 300,000 for 30%. 20%. 300,000 for 30%. 15% each, you got two sharks and you got 300, more 300,000 for 30%. I would yeah. do that. If we could calm down to 20%, we would make a deal right now. We'd love to work with you guys. You'll, you. you'll get something that you promise you. We, we, we will never sleep. Was that on purpose? Or were you just totally bossing it? Or uh, could you really not hear him and you weren't, you're just playing it off? Yeah, I think what's awesome is that night uh, when it aired, I got probably a million text messages that night. It was like, could you hear him? Could you hear him? You know, what was, what was the real thing, you know? Uh, and yeah, the first time they were both talking um, and they don't show that, but there was so much talking back and forth. And even Cuban was, was kind of cheering us on from the from the sidelines yeah. too, which you know was great. Guard. And um, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I think the first time I was just trying to get him to repeat what he said overall because we couldn't hear. And then you know, as soon as obviously I, I call into what he was saying and that he said that previously. So uh, you know, we were just something to, to get in. As, we, as as I said before, um, we knew exactly what we were doing in terms of the negotiation. We knew what numbers we were ready to hit on and what number we were ready to close on. Um, so it was just a matter of trying to get into um, kind of that sweet spot between them. And, you know, Lori actually came in under Robert, um, and I wasn't even thinking about that. As soon as I saw both of them side by side, and I knew that they had teamed up quite a bit before. Um, you know, I saw that leverage to come in and say, hey, can I get both of you guys, and then see if we could close a deal. And it all happened so fast um, after we started going 20-30, 20-30, um, that it was just kind of like this rapid pace and you were downhill and there was no brakes left on it. So um, I'm glad the outcome came out like it did. Yeah, it was pretty entertaining to watch. And I, I'm just, I'm watching you thinking, this is a Michael Scott moment. He's like, yeah, 20%, 30%, 20%. So uh, before we get to what Kevin did, I've got the clip of that. I'll play as we wrap up because I thought it was genius. I think when Kevin, and I'll just talk about it now, when Kevin stood up and said, hey, if she doesn't want to do it, I'll do it. Lori's like, no, 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 no. I'm in the deal. I'm in the deal. I think if I had been able to see the future, as soon as Kevin said, I'll do the deal, I'm like, done. 200,000 for 20%. Two sharks? Two sharks. All right, y'all got a deal? Deal. Done. Awesome. <laughs> Wait a minute. Or are you in? We were at 300,000 for 30% a minute ago. Right, and we dropped it to 200,000 for 20%. And Robert jumped up and said, deal? Well, I thought both, both of y'all yeah. were coming in on it. We would love yeah, we two shots are better than one. Lori's doing a little Michael Jackson moonwalk on you. All right, I'll tell you what. If Lori doesn't do it, I'll do it with Robert. You'll have two sharks. No, I'm in. Awesome. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, it was one of those moments where I realized that they're just egging each other on and shooting barbs. And I know sometimes Mark makes caustic comments to Lori just to get under her skin. Like, I'd really be curious. Sadly, you're the guinea pig in all this. I'd really be curious to see what happens sure. if you take that deal and, and cause a ruckus on stage, as you'd already done. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, at that point, we there was n not a thought in our head that we could possibly lose the deal. You know, I think what they show you on TV is kind of the drama filled, especially the preview to our episode. They showed so much suspense and uh, Damon like backing out early and maybe we had lost the deal with the Sharks in general. But, right. um, you know, I, I didn't feel like uh, at that point that there was a second for the deal to slip away. 
And we were actually very calm at that point, but it just, it was so quick. I mean, from the time that that all started, it was basically like two minutes. Uh, and then two minutes, uh, you know, Lori shut her book and stood up. So you can imagine how much rapid fire between three sharks and us going back and forth and then kind of closing the deal all in time. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, as I said before, that, that, that thing about Mr. Wonderful, you know, there's something still there. And uh, who knows, you know, maybe that's the one that got away from me at the end of the day. And uh, I'll get a chance to, to see him in the future. So I always think if I were the one pitching, what would I have done differently? Or what have I have uh, could kind of what could I add to? The one thing I thought of was I don't know if the Frisbee ones you guys have that you made his face on and Lori's face. I thought that was great. Um, I probably would have brought a pit bull and shaped it like Mr. Wonderful's dome and just had the pit bull <laughs> rip it to pieces, but that might have been self-defeating. Yeah, that might have been a, a little bit difficult to perform on camera, so we, you know, we, we were lucky we got the high 10 in there uh, while we could and Sadie was able to, to perform it properly, so uh, Sean worked really hard on, on training with her to do that and it was great that it worked you know, perfectly at the, on the show. That's awesome. So one last question about the deal. Yeah. Um, people who listen to my show know that I mentioned during Zine Pack or in other episodes that oftentimes having more than one shark makes it harder for the deal to close because of cooks versus sh- or chefs and wait, what am I saying here? Chiefs in India and chefs in the kitchen, whatever. Um, would you advise other entrepreneurs to try to go for the multi-shark deal or looking back, you said keying in on one investor. Do you think it's wiser to just say, look, Lori offered you 200 K for 18%. I should have just taken that because it would have simplified the process. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, I can't, I can't actually say that the, the simple way is always the best way. Um, and so I'll lead off with that. I would say that, you know, if you are in the position where you do have two sharks, because I don't, you know, there's, it's not, it's not like you can control it once you're in there at that point. Um, you know, I obviously wanted two sharks. It was something that I, I was kind of determined as soon as I saw both of them get into the deal. Um, but I think being able to really isolate one afterwards is important. Um, sometimes if they can also work to your favor, like when we couldn't get in touch with somebody, you know, we at least knew we had one side that was going to help us bridge that gap. And it kept the conversation going and it kept it moving for some time. Um, so I guess I would say is um, don't worry about whether or not you get one or two or three, get one. And, you know, after you get one or get two, whatever it may be, try to isolate them um, and work with each of them individually, and that will give you a greater outcome for success. Excellent. Excellent. All right, let's take a few minutes and talk about some of the things that came up in the show as it pertains to the Shark Tank tsunami. So you guys aired a few weeks ago. I talked to Sean via email. He said it's been going awesome. Uh, so to lay the groundwork for the question, you had done $1.4 million in sales in the two to two and a half years prior to airing or to recording. You claimed that you were going to do about $1.3 million that year, which would have been calendar year 2015, and now we're in April 2016. So give us a, an updated outlook of how the company's doing and, and how you guys did with the Shark Tank tsunami. Yeah, so we did um, just about a uh, million dollars in sales in 2015. Um, and this year, uh, this month has been um, just crazy. Um, you know, the final tallies are not in, but um, I can say that, you know, 20, over about 25% growth uh, on the year in this month. Um, so far, and it's only been about a week or so off of Shark Tank. Um, so we're really fortunate to have that. And uh, really the prospects that come out of Shark Tank, um, I can't clear my email and I pride myself on getting back to people very quickly uh, and working through everything. And uh, just the logistics of the overall company now, um, kind of the scale of the company has taken. Uh, and as I said before, there's a lot of moving pieces and logistical pieces that we added on right before Shark Tank. Um, so now it's it's just incredible. Um you try to put yourself in those shoes before and say, hey, this is what I'm going to be like afterwards, or here's all the different scenarios that are going to take place afterwards. But it's really impossible. Um, the opportunities that come available to you um, just because you have now the Shark Tank tile slapped next to your name um, are so abundant. Tell us about it a little bit. So is, have you seen the the highest bumps in terms, has it been social media sales? Has it been retailers contacting you? Has it been other investors and opportunists getting in touch and saying, hey, here's an idea, or hey, Stephen, we got to get you your own reality TV show? Like, where is the most action happening? Where are you getting the biggest bang for the buck? Yeah, the direct to consumer is the very first play. Um, to be honest with you, we haven't even had a chance to touch our retailers yet. Um, that's how busy we've been and, and haven't been able to keep our heads above water. Um, we've had some really nice high level discussions with all the big box retailers already. Um, literally those types of things took place within 24 hours after we, we found out that we were going to be on the show. Awesome. Um, you know, obviously everybody wants to know the outcome before you're airing. Um, and then they have really picked up since, uh, you know, everyone saw our episode, which a lot are, are calling it the most dramatic episode there's been in a long time. So 
I think that was kind of funny. Yeah, you got. I think um, it was fortuitous. You got kind of lucky in terms of the clothes because that's a that's a clincher, right? Like we're gonna. Air. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So if we we would have thought back, you know, ten months ago and said, "Hey, it was just so dramatic that we were gonna get on no matter what," maybe it would have helped with our anxiety right. the whole process in the ten month wait. So maybe I can go back and give that advice to anybody. If if you get into a uh, you know, an ending like we did, and there's a, a sound off between three sharks, and they're going after you, then you have a pretty good chance. To get yeah, on. <laughs> start stacking your inventory in the warehouse. You're good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the turn time was a big one. The four week customization turn time with a direct to consumer model. That's that's bad. So you talked about getting it down to two weeks or one week. What's that look like? Have you gotten down to the two week threshold? Have you hit one week? How how are you doing? Yeah, so we we, um, we can hit one week, um, and we can hit two weeks. Uh, right now, the Shark Tank stuff will be uh, three week delivery times to people, uh, which we feel is is um, it is a great on par average with what other people expect in customization. If you order a computer from Apple, um, they send a turnaround time is expected. Uh, right now, what we wanted to do is to make sure that we didn't go ahead and invest as much as possible right before Shark Tank, and then be stuck afterwards if in fact something didn't happen right. Um, so really, we, we caught it Monday. Um, we had a group team meeting on Monday um, to evaluate kind of the scale and how everything was moving through our process. Um, we added in more designers, um, more um, staff on our Chinese teams, uh, and really tried to scale up because the one thing that we didn't want was to um, scale up too big before the show and then have this deflation. Um, so now uh, we, we feel like we're properly ready to, to handle um, the turnaround time in the future uh, and now, obviously, for those that order previously. Have you? This is just strictly curiosity. Have you seen any offers for uh, takeovers for people who want to buy you out now that you've got all this momentum? Yeah, we've we've had uh, quite a bit of inbound for joint ventures. Um, right now, I'm not really um, you know paying attention to those necessarily. Uh, we want to put everything kind of on this on the back burner at this point. Um, get through the next three weeks, next four weeks, see where um, plans take us, and then um, start looking for pos- possible partnerships. Um, you know, I think. This, this space is ripe for something like Nike ID, as we've been explaining all along. And the fact that pets um, are now a member of your family, and uh, now Nike ID is a $500 million plus company uh, within the athletic apparel, athletic apparel space, um, we believe we can take that to pet. Uh, and so finding the right partners is something that we're definitely interested in um, on how to take it to the next level. But we really want to be selective. Like I said, we, we have a great group here. And uh, we're really committed to uh, the future. We want to make sure that the same person who's going to come partner with us is going to have the same ideals. Okay, so we're going to get off topic here a little bit because being being that I don't have any pets in my home, so I don't you know sleep with my dog, I don't let it brush, use my toothbrush, uh, but I have my sister-in-law and some friends that I have are super hardcore pet lovers, so okay. I give them jabs all the time. Do you guys have like a customer avatar wall where you define the type of customer you're dealing with like, and they're you know, Amazon says a prime customer is going to spend $2,000 more a year than a regular one. Do you have that? Sure. Like, do you have the picture of the person who sleeps with their dog, who lets them use their toothbrush, who eats out of the same bowl? And then you have like the low level one who makes their dog stay outside all day long and you know what the dollar value is per those per year? Or is it not that sophisticated? Be honest with me. Well, I wouldn't say that uh, we have it to a T, but uh, not only, you know, everybody's personality in the office is a little bit different. Everyone's a dog owner and Uh, We definitely probably have the personality for everyone in this office, whether it's somebody who's obsessed with their dog and taking them everywhere to the one that's, uh, you know, barely giving them a sock to play with, et cetera. But um, I think if you go to our website now uh, and you see the different collections, uh, we made those collections as uh, representations to the type of pet owners there are, Um, you know, from the Ruff Lauren collection, which is fun, supposed to be the outdoors type, to, um, you know, the, the... uh, Emilio Puccio, uh, which is kind of the family dog. You know, we, we wanted to make sure that we covered every basis because what we see typically in the pet industry is that they're trying to, to, to focus on really the product and what the product means to people specifically as a marketing tool. And for us, it's the type of dog you have and the type of relationship you have with that dog, and that's going to define the type of product that you get for them. Uh, and we really want to have fun with it. And, and I think that's uh, why we go down that route. Um, we do have pretty advanced analytics. I won't say we don't geek out on that. My background's in tax. Uh, so we definitely have a lot of data around who we're selling to and what type of consumers we have. Uh, but I won't bore you with that. Uh, you know, we'll stick to the fact that uh, we watch who takes their dog in, in and out of the bathroom or in and out of the bedroom with them. Uh, and that's how we go out and, and market and target those people. 
Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've, <laughs> I don't want to get into that discussion, but I don't, I'm hoping to offend anyone, especially in your office, because this can be a sensitive <laughs> topic. But like you said, no you make your dog play with a sock, you, <laughs> you're going to burn in hell. I love the uh, collections. I'm going to do a screenshot so people can see them on your website. Which one of these is the most profitable? Just out of curiosity, where does the, the bulk of the sales come from? Yeah, I think the, um, the Kate Spade, um, everyone really likes the Kate Spade colors and choices. Um, something that we're going to be bringing to um, our supporters very, very soon is all new designs. Um, we have a, a complete refresher coming, um, all new looks coming, much more stylish, um, giving people what they want in terms of collections, uh, really articles that you would feel comfortable um, you know, putting up against your house and to some of the luxury items in your house as well. So um, really, I think what people have in store for those collections is to see um, just way more product, a lot more designs and something that, um, something for everyone. And then in terms of your strategy for marketing, you mentioned direct to consumer is kind of where it's at, but what social media platform is your jam? Is it Instagram? Yeah, Instagram is definitely our jam. Uh, we're starting to gain a lot of traffic on Pinterest. Uh, we love Pinterest because we think we can direct, uh, and, and speak directly to our following, um, just more clearly. Um, you know, the, the images, the robustness of the platform is, is much better, but, uh, I would definitely say we started on Instagram. It's kind of our bread and butter. Uh, we grow about 250 to 300 followers a day through Instagram. And, uh, you know, it's just something that we feel that we really well to our supporters um, through that network and through the, the caption of our photos. And I think that uh, we're just really appreciative of the support. All right, I want to close out with this because I think anyone who's selling online is interested in this topic. And that is that mm -hmm. um, my buddy from social media marketing world is telling me that the bulk of sales online from social media come from Pinterest. But most of the people I know mm -hmm. that are rocking it are on Instagram. So kind of give us some of the, uh, the secret ninja advice of what's working for you in terms of Shopify integration, in terms of posting schedule, frequency, tactics. Give us some of the secret sauce. What's really helping you drive sales through social media? So it's viral interaction, I think, is the most important. It's not wasting your time on the outskirts um, and the top of the funnel, but it's really finding the people, <clears throat> not only the influencers, but other people within the communities and within other uh, platforms, not necessarily Instagram, but um, different platforms that arrange group meetings and, and et cetera, and really focusing on the uh, viral pockets of those to exploit the viral pockets and to get them to share your story. Because at the end of the day, um, social media is all about interaction. And we can all interact with it a bunch as, as much as we want. Um, but it's those who are going to find the right zones to, to where they're going to interact, which are going to propel their voice, which is going to make it um, the most profitable for them at the end of the day. And um, that's what we feel we do best. We, we find um, really the niche markets which exist within pet, um, the real specifics, whether it's people that um, – you know, are, are, are taking their dog to park, parks constantly. Maybe it's the ones that are um, taking with them to restaurants, whatever it may be. Uh, we want to know the behavior, as you mentioned previously, and we want to tap those behaviors within those viral communities and get them to excel. Outstanding. Well, you know, Steve, what I'd love to do is uh, do some kind of collaboration or contest in conjunction with this. Would you be up for that? Awesome. Yeah, I would definitely be up for that. All right. I know there's a lot of dog lovers in my audience. I keep saying dog, pet, right? I had a sugar glider. So what do I know about dogs and, and cats? Well, hey, we'll make you a custom sugar glider product, <laughs> whatever you need. Uh, yeah. And so we'll do a, some hashtag where I can mock my listeners for sharing their toothbrushes with, uh, with their dogs. Are you a toothbrush definitely. sharer? I'm not a toothbrush sharer, no, but I'm a bed sharer. So I, I do meet that criteria. All right. I don't, I didn't want, do you have a scale? I need to see something like the dog lover um, scale, right? Like the truth. I just want to see kind of where you fall. Can, how many, how many levels down are you as a bed share from the top level? Uh, you know, I think, uh, in, in terms of being with my dog overall, I'd say I've had a, about an eight of 10, uh, Mona, uh, my dog, Mona, who's an English staffy, uh, traveled with me everywhere to get the company started. Um, she's a, the, the main reason, uh, why, why the company's here today, along with our other co-founders dogs. And, uh, you know, she's, she's with me pretty much every single day of work and wherever I go. So she's definitely the uh, mascot of the company. So you haven't achieved perfection, but you're getting close is what you're saying. You're I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting close. I'm not a 10, but you know, I'm, I'm probably borderline eight. Well, best of luck to you with the company. I'm sure my listeners Thanks will really so uh, be benefited from what you shared today. And, uh, we look forward to seeing some awesome updates and news from you in the future. DJ, thank you so much for that. Thank you. All right, I'll tell you what. If Lori doesn't do it, I'll do it with Robert. You'll have two sharks. No, I'm in. Awesome. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Did you really want the deal or you just wanted to screw Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it, Baron. Thank you so much. Come on, let's go. Hey, grab your leash. Grab your leash. Let's go.
Let's go. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. I think having two sharks, you don't only get all the skills and the traits um, from what Robert brings to the yeah. table, but also um, the amazing presence that Lori has as well. And in combination uh, with our team, we feel like we can take over the world essentially in the pet world. Kevin, throw the frisbee. Kevin. Are you kidding? This is incredibly valuable. Throw the frisbee. No, I don't want to damage it. Here you go. Here you go, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for jumping in to the Shark Tank Podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and head over to sharktankpodcast.net to get the show notes from each episode and join the free Shark Tank Insiders list. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Shark Tank Podcast and on Twitter at Shark Tank PDcast.